Happy Monday. So, a couple of things. As always, we have Alex due on Monday, because it's Monday. Your chemistry and life assignment is due September 29th. In my first session of this, I got asked a lot of questions like, how formal is this? What I'm really asking for is, what did you see? What made it interesting to you? And how does it relate to chemistry? This isn't a lab report. This is not a formal document. This is more formal than a diary entry, but way less formal than like an assignment document, right? It can be anything chemistry related, anything we've talked about this semester, anything tangentially chemistry related, things you know about chemistry. Um, it's due September 29th at the start of class. There's no late work. Questions about Alex or the chemistry and life assignment? Yeah. Um, could the way it relates to chemistry be something we haven't gone over yet? Because I thought it was like um, a combustion um, reaction, and I like mentioned it to my friend that knows a lot about chemistry than me, and she was like, actually, that's a physical change, and I really haven't gone over that in class yet. Would I be allowed to say that that's what's happening? Because my thing was maybe so cheap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the rules of this are broad. However you see it in your life, that is the biggest. So if you look, I don't want to say I watch a lot of like TikTok and reels, but like if you watch one, there was the one where people make like the elephant toothpaste thing that was very big for a while. That's the one where you pour two things together and it basically explodes. All of these things are chemistry. You can pick anything. If you do something that I can find on the internet, I would like access to it. So if you watched, I don't know, the 90s version of CSI Las Vegas that's coming back, I think this week, that is bound to have some science in it. Well, maybe. it should have science. It might not. You can pick any of those. Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that you watch, where I, the goal is for you to see it in your life because nine times out of ten, students are like, I mean, chemistry is so dumb. It doesn't even relate to my life. The idea is to see three times where it does. Grilled cheese is quite per I mean, it is a physical change, but like if you burn it, it's a combustion reaction. So. <laughs> yes, I will accept that. Any other questions about your chemistry and life assignment? Okay, the tune up course. So. On Thursday at 5, you will have to have decided whether or not you want to stay in Gen Chem 1 or transfer to the tune-up course. Now, the tune-up course is Chem 1025, so if you have taken that at UNF or anywhere else in the Florida system, we're riding this train together through this semester. You cannot go retake intro if you've already taken it. That's like a big rule. So. If you, this is your first semester, you're returning to college, and you're like, oh, my stars, you went, and I didn't come with you. So the tune-up course, here's the goal. So my friend developed this, and I helped. One of the things we realized is sometimes students don't get the same, you don't encounter the same things in high school chemistry or maybe you took high school chemistry in the 80s, I don't know, or whenever you encountered that. This is a way for you to say like, I'm not doing the best I could, I'm gonna take a break, I'm gonna go to the intro course, and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna nail it in the spring. The advantage to this is that UNF and every other university, you get a limited number of withdrawals. Withdrawals are, I don't wanna say permanent on your transcript, but it is a note, like. You enrolled in this course, and then you get a W, and you withdrew. Withdrawing isn't bad. You just only get a couple. So this is like a backdoor way where you will basically be, I don't want to say deleted out of this course, but it will, there will be no record that you were ever here, except I will recognize you, and you will recognize me. But that's it. There's no record. There's no grades. Nothing. It will just look like you enrolled in a 2H, which is the second half of the semester intro course. The intro course itself is DL, so that means it's online. It also comes with a study skills component. Now, you may be like, I don't need help with studying. 
if you are making an unsatisfactory in this course, some level of assistance in studying will help you. It's also mandatory. It's in person. It is on Thursdays from 5 to 5.50. If you are in a and 2 lab on Thursdays from 5 to 5.50, you can't take the tune-up course. If you have other issues or whatever else, we can talk about it. So this is what it is. So you will depart the gradebook from here on Thursday. This course starts later in the semester. You can continue to attend the lectures, but you are no longer required to do Alex, mini exams, midterm exams, or any other graded assignment for this course. So I told you what it is. Who should go? So your mini exams are here. You'll get them at the end, because otherwise you'll just look at those and I'll write stuff on the board and no one will be here but me. <clears throat> so if you look on the grades panel, all the way either on the side, on the right, or if you're on the app at the bottom, it will say a number divided by another number, then we'll have an S or a U. S for satisfactory, U for unsatisfactory. Midterm grades are not letter grades here at UNF at this point in time. They're just satisfactory and unsatisfactory. So if you have an unsatisfactory, you should consider this. Now, if you took mini exam one, and let's say you got 15, not great. But you went to every SI, you went to tutoring, you came to office hours, you got your life together, and now you've made a 60. The way statistics and math works, you may or you're still like right on the bubble. But in my opinion, by going from a not good score to a much better score, I expect you to be able to achieve that higher level score going forward. However, because of the way numbers work, you may still have an unsatisfactory. If you have questions about that, you can just send me an email, stop in office hours, I'll help you. Your mini exam scores, so what happens in Canvas, is not going to happen until tomorrow morning. Here's why. You have Alex homework due tonight, and I would like to be able to give you all the scores that we have to like try to make this decision. So they will go up tomorrow morning. I'd like to be very clear. When I say morning, I mean before noon. I do not mean at 7.30. At 7.30, I'm walking my dog, waiting for coffee. So not happening at that point. Um, because I think sometimes students get kind of like, I don't want to say messy in their own brain, I will send you a Canvas email that says, hi, I think you should consider this. Here's how you do it. So if you do not get one of these, I don't think you need to go to the tune-up course. They will arrive this evening during the Eagles-Cowboys game or tomorrow morning if I don't finish because I get invested in the game. So let's say you get your score and you feel like you're on the bubble. You can send me an email and say, I'd like to talk to you. We can also talk about it here like after class because I don't, I mean, I have other places to go, but not that many. Um, if you have questions, if you would like to actually talk about it and talk through like, okay, what do we do? Let's say that you missed the kick in the pants on mini exam one, but now you're like, oh, okay, now I'm gonna get it together. I'm still happy to have conversations about how we can make you the most successful student. If you get the early alert, so I'm also filing early academic alerts, which basically means I will email you, then I will email your advisor, and then your advisor will email you, and you will get some automated generated systems. It would be impossible for you not to know that I recommend this for you. Mm, only if you never check your email which is a valid total like normal thing in life, that would make that a little bit more complicated. So if you would like to chat with me, you can come to office hours. There may or may not be other people there. Or you can send me an email. If you would like to meet with me via Zoom, please suggest three times. And not like I'm available all afternoon, but you really have a class for three hours in the afternoon. I feel like I'm happy to meet with you. I am happy to talk this through with you. Um, please do not surprise me by bringing your parents. You're welcome to bring your parents if you choose to. Just give me a heads up that it will not just be you. Questions about the tune-up course? Oh, 
you can take the tune-up course, and then you can still take me next semester. You don't have to be like, it's not an ind indication that this class will not work for you. It's that this adventure is not going well. Again, it is my goal for everyone who takes this, who enrolled on day one, to be successful, whether that's in Gen Chem 1 or taking the tune-up course and just like slam dunking it next semester. Questions? You guys are always so quiet. Makes me feel like I'm very clear, which I worry about. All right. So, chapter four. A couple of things. On the outline slide, if you if you own the textbook and read the textbook, all like one of you, maybe more of you, maybe some of you are looking at it. It's important to note, so I took chapter four and I put it in a blender and it looks nothing like the textbook. I basically rearranged the parts, put the things that I think make sense together, together, yada, yada, yada. The parenthet the parentheses, those are the sections in the book. So if you want to read about aqueous solutions, it's 4.1 and 4.5. I took those together. I think they make more sense than reading part one and then coming back to the same topic like 10 pages later. But today, whoops, we are going to start to talk about aqueous solutions. So on Wednesday, yep, Wednesday of last week, we started thinking about what is an aqueous solution, right? Aqueous solutions mean something in water. Did we get through homogeneous and heterogeneous or just solute and solvent? Excellent. So, heterogeneous and homogeneous mixtures are basically just different ways that we can think about solutions or other parts. So a mixture, by definition, is two or more things together, whether it's in a beaker or in a solid. So a homogeneous mixture this means that they are not easily separated. So this could be two liquids or a single solid A heterogeneous, these are in fact easily separated. So I think of this as two solids, a liquid plus a solid. So let's think about the, yeah. Either one of those is fine. They're basically just the same word in different scientific groups. So it turns out, if you were trained by people from the UK, you say certain words in one direction, or if you are different types of chemists. So those are the same term. I just say them differently. So homo homogeneous and homogeneous are the same word. It just matters who trained you how to say things or where you watch a lot of YouTube videos, hard to say. So a heterogeneous mixture would be like if you had a glass of water and I put rocks in it. In theory, you could, well not in theory, indefinite, you can pour your water rock solution through a strainer and the rocks will stay in the strainer and the water will go through. If you have water and I have dumped salt in it, not a lot of salt, just like a little, Start it up. When you pour it through a strainer, nothing will stay in the strainer, right? So a heterogeneous means you can easily separate them. Or if you have a bowl of Cheerios and Fruit Loops, you really can't like separate. Those are really easy to separate. But it would be hard if you had a bowl of Fruit Loops to separate out. Actually, I don't know what's in Fruit Loops, so we'll say like 
wheat and eggs, probably not those, I don't know, Fruit Loop ingredients. Whatever's in there, with those Fruit Loops, you cannot like pulverize it enough to get back out the stuff that went into that. So in this case, when we think about these things, we can think about whether or not you can separate them easily. So electrolytes and non-electrolytes. An electrolyte <clears throat> is something that dissolves into its components. So if you add sodium chloride in the water, it's going to dissolve into sodium plus aqueous plus Cl minus, also aqueous. So it is worth considering in this moment that the word dissolves has more than one meaning in terms of this. Because a non-electrolyte means that it does not ionize. When dissolved. So if you add sugar, the sugar molecule is molecularly still the same in water. So in this case, we're not talking about whether or not you have salt water or rock water. We're talking about whether or not you have salt water or sugar water. <clears throat> So electrolyte, it turns out, means it will electrocute you if you add electricity to the water. If you were to have pure water, please do not do this. There is no such thing as pure water in Florida. I just want to be very clear about this due to the high humidity content of life. In theory, if you have pure water, pure, pure water, it will not electrocute you if you were to add electrolyte according to that. In practice, it will definitely electrocute you, to be clear. You don't need a lot of ions for this to electrocute you. But if you were to have pure water plus sugar, pure sugar, it also shouldn't electrocute you because there's no electrical ions to pass the current. Again, I want to be very clear, mostly because we're recording this, putting it on the internet. Please do not, under any circumstance, try to electrocute yourself with water and electrical wires, whether it's regular water or salt water, I saw that in the back, making me laugh. Just want to be very clear, I am not recommending this. What you do on your own time is your own problem. But please don't take a video of it and use it as your chemistry and light. It's a terrible plan. So, I have mentioned that I run. So when we think about electrolytes, more often than not, most of us are thinking like Gatorade, Pedialyte, I like to use Noon because it's not as sweet. There are 900 different electrolyte versions you can take for your fitness endeavors or for other reasons why you might like to have electrolytes in your life. The thing is, in that bottle, there are no, there should not be solids. You have ions and sugar water. Pretty much that's what you have in these compounds. And so the reality is that what we need to think about next is what does it mean for something to be solvated? So we know, add salt to water, stir. Now we have salt water. But what happened to the sodium chloride ion in the solution? So water is a polar molecule. We are going to talk, not ad nauseum, but like a whole lot about what it means to be polar later in the semester. But polar basically means that it's lopsided in terms of its electrons. Its electron density is not even. If it were to be a top, it would be unlevel. So in this case, if you were to structurally draw water, you get these delta plus, which is the lower case, lower case Greek letter D for delta. Delta plus and delta minus. So when we think about a compound, it's usually neutral. Polar compounds basically have these slight charges kind of hanging around. 
So the solvation by water basically says that the slightly negative portion of water is going to interact with the potassium, nope, sodium ion. So if we have Na plus, we're gonna get this lattice work of water molecules surrounding our sodium ion. So in the picture on the slides, on the left side, we see these green spheres and purple spheres. Those are the chlorine and sodium ions. And if you look very closely, which is kind of hard if you don't have them on your screen, what we can actually see is that the water molecules orient themselves either red side in or the white side in based on which ion it is. So it turns out that for the Cl minus, the white side, which is the slightly positive side, orients towards the molecule. This phenomenon is really observed a lot in biological, biological systems. It's called clock rate cages, or it helps solvate proteins or anything else. So the other part of this solvation that we need to talk about, oh, and I just erased those words. So what happens if it's a non-electrolyte? You dissolved it into there. So today, what we're going to do is take the word dissolve and think about it in more than one term. Typically, I think that I can no longer observe the solid. We also want to think about what does it mean when the molecule is inside the water. So if we look at this one over here, we can see these right here are methanol molecules. Maybe you can't see, you could trust me, that these slightly bigger bumps are methanol. Methanol is CH3OH. When you put it in water, it just stays together molecularly. But it can be dissolved, meaning you can't easily separate them. So it's going to be important for us to remember what can dissolve into its ions and what stays as its like whole molecule. So let's talk about what I thought came next. Strength of electrolyte. How strong or how well does something separate? Some compounds totally dissolve. Some things dissolve a little bit. A good dissolve a little bit example. If you make sweet tea. Here, if I make sweet tea, I boil tea bags in water, let it sit. And then I add so much sugar. Because that's how you make it sweet. You add a lot of sugar when it's hot so that it will dissolve. If you miss the window, you try to add the same amount of sugar when it's cold, you get sugar slurry at the bottom, right? So that tells us that there is a range of solubility and dilution solution shenanigans. So in this course, we're mostly going to deal with the yes or no. It either dissolves or it doesn't. Gen Chem 2 is going to talk about the kinetics of how well something dissolves. When we're talking about weak dissolving things, I'll make it pretty clear. 99.35% of the time, we will only discuss strong dissolving. It's also not a wildly accurate statistic, so you know. So in this case, a strong electrolyte <coughs> completely dissolves into its ions. So if you have a strong acid, such as hydrochloric acid, when you mix that with water, it dissolves into H plus aqueous plus the L minus aqueous. So in this case, a strong electrolyte, the reaction only goes one way. This arrow right here is a one way. The hydrochloric acid goes into water and they separate and they don't come back. This isn't some sort of a balance where some is dissolved and some is not. So for the purposes of our class, ionic compounds, we're going to add a soluble here. Even though we haven't really talked about soluble, we will in a moment. 
soluble ionic compounds, and strong acids, and bases. So, one thing you'll notice today is that I'm going to use a bunch of words that we haven't started defining yet. So we haven't really talked about what is an acid and what is a base. Hopefully at some other point you're like, oh, acids, I don't know, are tart. Please don't taste anything. Bases are not tart. The reality is that we're going to, what I'm trying to do is set us up so that when we move into acids and bases and solubility, we've already covered all of our bases. So if there are notes where you're like, I don't know what that means, make a little note in your notes. So then when we cover that, you can review it and be like, I see. She painted the picture before we could see the whole thing. So a weak electrolyte. No. Yes. It's basically, it does not completely ionize. So an example of that is acetic acid, which is the acid in vinegar, CH3COOH aqueous. And now we get different arrows. We see the CH3COO minus or the acetate ion plus H plus. This means that there is an equilibrium. What this means in terms of chemistry is that some of the acetic acid dissolves. But if you were to remove some portion of this, it will have to rebalance re itself. So in Gen Chem 1, we are mostly going to live here. In Gen Chem 2, we're going to not be. I don't teach that class. But you will get to explore this vastly interesting place where things have equilibria. Yeah? Why did you write the other oxygen atoms like that? Like, why did you write them out like that instead of O2? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is, why did I write COOH? So, this COOH thing right here is one way that scientists can identify whether or not it's an acid. So either way would be fine. I really could care less. So more likely you would have written it CH3C, maybe like this. Really any combination of these, I will not be all that picky. But this basically tells me when I look at it, it will be an acid. More often than not, you will not we don't talk a lot about acetic acid in here, but it is the best weak acid example that we have. So you do not need to memorize that it looks like that. Other questions? So for the purposes of this course, I always like to make sure we're all on the same playing field. We should assume all Strong acids and bases fully ionize. And all soluble ionic compounds fully ionize. Next semester in Chem 2, You'll explore things that do other than this. For now, when we think about what ions are in solution, it is either soluble or not. We're not going to spend a lot of time looking at this like, I don't know what I call it, the gray area between what is soluble and what is not. So one of the things we're going to talk a lot about today is what do you find in solution? So, the polyatomic ion table. If, if you're still thinking that maybe you don't need to memorize it, the reason I had you memorize that in chapter two is not just for naming. Here in chapter four, 
I want you to be able to look at this aluminum sulfate and say, I know what that breaks down into. The aluminum ions and the sulfate ions. So in this case, we're asking ourselves, what ions do we see in solution? So for aluminum, Al2, SO4, 3, when this dissolves, how many aluminum ions do we get? A lot of numbers here. So I only see two based on this subscript here. We'll make sure we're all on the same page here. Al3, two aluminums. So you'll notice that I started adding the charges and this open parentheses, AQ, close parentheses. Last week, we talked about how water is the solvent. We are thinking about reactions that happen in a beaker of water. Water isn't really ever going to be present because it's just this weird free letter that hangs around during these reactions. So we're not going to write about it. We just say that it's there by saying like, oh, it's aqueous. So how many sulfate ions do I have? Three. So in this case, we can think about what happens when this goes into solution. So if we look at KCl, aqueous, that's going to break down into K plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. So if we look at sodium phosphate, Na3PO4, aqueous, how many sodium ions do we have? Three. Three Na plus aqueous plus PO4, three minus aqueous. So when we start to dissolve things, they dissolve into their ions. So we need to make sure the charges Come with them. And for the most part, they come apart, but only into their polyatomics. So everything that we see should basically break in half. Now, one half might have multiple copies, but we're not going to really see anything where you just like the sulfate ion isn't going to explode into sulfurs and oxygens. It should just break apart into a cation and an anion. So these last two, we have CH4 and C6H12O6. Are these ionic compounds? No. Do non-ionic compounds dissolve? If you cannot easily identify an ion in this, it's going to be a molecule. Just, I don't want to say by default, there are some things that look a little weird. But for the purposes of Jenkins 1, when we see CH4 or C6H12O6, these are not applicable. They don't dissolve into their ions. They stay together because they are molecules. So if it is an ionic compound, that means it is created by two ions stuck together, kind of held together by forces. Molecular compounds have molecular bonds, and those bonds stay together when they hang out with water. So you might be like, oh, stars, how are we going to know the difference? Fair question. Pretty much, if you can easily identify a metal and some other polyatomic ion, it's an ionic compound. If it is some, a bunch of non-metals stuck together, is probably a molecule. Alex will use the same types of definitions. But it'll start throwing molecules at you that you've never seen. So one, panic. Two, say, mm, mm I don't have time to panic. And look at it and ask, can I break this into a metal and a polyatomic or not? If it is things on only the right side of the periodic table, it is probably a molecule. 
Questions? Yeah. Uh, for your aluminum sulfate, is your sulfate going to be aqueous or not? Oh, it is. Sorry. Good question. They should always be, if it is dissolving into its ions, they are aqueous. Basically, we're asking if you took sodium phosphate solid and dropped it into water, what happens in the water? So if you had sodium phosphate in this box on the front desk, it will say sodium phosphate solid until it rains in here, which will hopefully never happen. But it will not dissolve into its ions in its solid form. So if you're thinking about ions, they have to be distributed in water. Good question. So the next thing we really want to think about is the concentration of a solution. Thus far, we talked about density. Density is basically mass <clears throat> per volume. One of the issues with density or weight per volume or any of these is they're kind of hard to compare. And they can be determined by how you make the solution. But if I want to add 10 sodium ions and 10 sulfate ions and mix those together, I need to figure out how to equilibrate those. And we know that moles and moles are comparable, right? 5 grams of sodium and 5 grams of plutonium which is at the bottom of the periodic table. Though one of those is lighter than the other, so you'll get a different distribution of atoms. But we know if we have five moles of one and five moles of the other, you have the same number of atoms regardless of mass. So molarity is going to allow us to compare regardless of mass of the compound. So molarity is moles per liter. But molarity tends to be used as a unit, kind of like joules, which we haven't talked about, or calories, which we also haven't talked about. But it is a defined complex unit. So molarity has the symbol big M, and it's moles divided by liters. I will often try to shorten that, I will shorten molarity to molar. Like that is a three molar solution. That is a 1.25 molar solution. It's just, I don't know why it's shortened that way, but that's what it is. So in this case, what we can start to do is use the molarity, we can calculate the molarity. So it asks, what is the concentration in capital M or molar of a solution when 23.4 grams of sodium sulfate is dissolved in 125 mils of water. So all we're doing, we're taking two calculations that we're already, hopefully, very proficient at. The ability to convert grams to moles and the ability to convert milliliters to liters. And then we're going to divide those two numbers. So in this case, I'm going to take my 23.4 grams of sodium sulfate. And then I'm going to use the molar mass, which is 142.05 grams in one mole. That gives me 0 0.165 moles. And then I'm going to take my 125 milliliters and convert that to liters. And then the molarity is 0 0.165 moles divided by 0 0.125 liters. Nope. And that gives you 1.32 molar sodium sulfate. Now, it's often a pretty, pretty standard question. Do you have to show this calculation? The mils to liter calculation? No. I'm trying this so if you write it down and when you go home and you forgot that you came, you can remember how we got from milliliters to liters. If you automatically knew that 125 mils is 0.125 liters, you don't need to show extra work for that. 
You can just write down like, oh, volume equals 0 0.125 liters. I'm fully fine with that. What questions do we have about this calculation? So I'm going to give you the molar mass of sucrose. I want you to repeat that calculation. If your calculator is not out, go ahead and grab it. So if the molecular weight is 342.34 grams, what is the molarity in molar of a solution where 3.68 grams of sucrose is dissolved in 275 milliliters of water? I'm going to give you about 90 seconds. Looks like about most, some, some of you have answered. How many of you have answered? Excellent. So we're going to take our 3.68 grams of sucrose using the molar mass. We're going to convert to moles. And that gives us 0 0.0107 moles. Then I'm going to convert my 275 milliliters divided by 1,000. One liter, that gives us 0 0.275 liters. Normally, if I was writing this out, I would have solved this, and I would have drawn a division sign between the two. I wouldn't rewrite it. But in this case, we will, for clarity, 0 0.0107. 07 divided by 0 0.275, and that gives you 0 0.0391 molar. What questions do we have about the ability to calculate the molarity if you're provided either the mass or the moles of the solute and the volume? Yeah? Why do we need so the molarity is used both in constant, so the concentration is preferred in most labs. So when I make a sodium chloride solution, instead of saying it's one gram per mil, I would say that it is 0.25 molar. So you don't have to convert between grams and mil, you can convert between moles. So it allows you to skip the grams to moles calculation when we use it in balanced equations. Yes. So the question is, because you could basically determine the weight of a sugar, you could can determine the concentration. I used to use an example that calculated the concentration of ethanol in beer, which is, is an interesting phenomenon. It turns out that that calculation uses a bunch of really odd assumptions in order to get to the answer, but you can, provided you know the actual mass that goes in, 
as opposed to a percentage. If you have a percentage, it gets a little wonky. But otherwise, yes, you can calculate the concentration of anything based on what you could find on a, like a label on the back, as long as it's a mass and you can figure out what the volume is. Right. Yeah, so if you had eight grams of sugar in a soda, that's like a lot, it feels like. Okay, well, that's even more than what I was thinking, so. But yes, you could figure out what the concentration of that is. And then you have to ask yourself, like, is that a lot or does it just feel like it's a lot? I mean, it's probably a lot. Just saying, I don't want to make any, like, dietary statements about sodas. But, yes, you definitely can. Any other questions? So we can calculate the concentration. And so what about if we have a solution with a concentration, and now I want to think about what is the concentration of the ion in solution? So if we have one molar in ACL, when that dissolves into sodium ions and chloride ions, we have one molar sodium plus, aqueous, and one molar chloride minus, also aqueous. If you have one mole of sodium chloride, that is composed of one mole of sodium and one mole of chlorine, correct? So in this case, the concentration of the ions feels rather, I don't want to call it simple, but it doesn't feel complex. However, if instead we have one molar sodium sulfate, that's going to break down into sodium and sulfate ions, right? So let's look at the sulfate ion first. For every one mole of sodium sulfate, how many moles of sulfate are in there? I see a couple of like very medium confident ones, very confident. So we're going to have a concentration of one molar sulfate ions. Now, how many in one mole of sodium sulfate, how many moles of sodium are there? Two. two. So because this breaks apart into two sodiums and one sulfate, the concentration of sodium ions is going to be two. Because the two sodium ions in there both dissolve, and then there are two of them. Which is very similar to the stuff that's going on around the board, where we took the aluminum sulfate and dissolved that into the number of the components. So our next example, 0 0.21 molar PCL. Oops. That dissolves into 0 0.21 molar PCL. Nope, oh, that doesn't do that. Potassium ions, sorry. Or 0 0.21 molar chloride ions, aqueous. So what questions do we have about thinking about the concentration of the ions within a solution of a complex ion? It is okay for at this point you're like, feel like you're making a big deal about this, and I don't know why, and I don't know if I don't understand it. I'm just a little confused, like with the sodium um, salt ions. So it's like two moles for the sodium, but it winds up one for SO4. Okay, so in the chemical formula, how many sulfate ions, if you were to break that into its parts, are there? One. There's just one. So it's a... One mole of sodium sulfate breaks down into two sodiums and a sulfate. And so because the concentration is moles divided by liters, it doubles if you have two of the ions in comparison to the other. Other questions? Yes? So, um, Then they would both be, let's make up a different compound. 
So we're just going to make one up. We're going to use regular things. It is not real. This is like, I don't want to say not real, not good. But so if you had one molar of sodium three sulfate two. So if this does not exist, I want to be very clear. Do not write this in your notes and be like, see, you said it. It's fake. So you have one mole of this, but for every one mole of that, you have three sodium ions and two sulfates. So the molarity would be three molar sodium plus and two molar sulfates because those parentheses would change the concentrations. But again, this is a fake molecule. Please annotate your notes correctly. So if you have a different problem where it comes out that there's two molar or both of them, do you simplify it down to one molar each? Or do you leave this to be? So the question is, if you were, so like, I think the girl behind you had asked, if it had been Na2SO4 parentheses two, in that case, both of these would have been two molar. So it doesn't, it doesn't typically simplify. We don't usually see that, but if you did, that would be how you would treat it. Other questions? So molarity, let's be honest, feels like a trick. It's a pretty easy calculation. We all know that that's not where this ends. This is my class. So the reality is we can use molarity just like we would have used density or just like in a balanced chemical equation where we used grams in the past. So instead of saying I had five grams of this, I could say I had 20 mils of this concentration solution. What is the product? So in this case, we can start to use molarity as part of our calculations. So in this case, it asks how many moles of HNO3 are in two liters of 0.2 molar HNO3. So we're gonna take our 0 0.200 molar and that is equivalent to 200 moles in one liter. Then I'm going to multiply that by 0. Point, nope, by 2 liters. And that's going to give me 0. 0.400 moles of HNO3. Now, this step right here, where I took 0. 0.2 molar, and then I shattered the units. You don't have to show that step. I show that step so that you know if your units are going to cancel out. I'm a big units person because the units can tell you where to go even if you don't know where to go in your calculation. So in this case, our leaders both canceled and that gave us moles at the end. If you don't need this step, you don't have to show this step. It's just how I tend to think about it. So the next example asks, how many grams of sodium sulfate are required to make 0 0.350 liters of 0.5 molar sodium sulfate? So I'm going to take my 0 0.500 molar, which is 0.5 moles in one liter, we're going to multiply that by the volume of 0 0.350 liters. Which gives me 0 0.175 moles. Then we're going to convert using 142.06 grams in one mole. And that gives us a value of 24 0.9 grams. <coughs> so what questions do we have about these two calculations? So 
on slide 12, there are two examples. We are going to move to the next part, but on Wednesday, we are going to start by solving these. So I want you, between now and then, to try to solve these. The, so there's the top one and the bottom one. The top one is harder than the bottom one. So do the bottom one first. I realized that after I posted the slides, so do the bottom one first. The top one is a version of an exam question. I like this question. I have asked it, or parts of this, for a while. So make sure that you know how to do both of these. We will go through them step by step on Wednesday. Please give it your best go. Even if what you write down is, ah, I don't know what to do. You at least, okay, maybe don't go that far, but you at least gave it your best or a best effort. So the next part of this chapter talks about a precipitation reaction. Precipitation reactions are pretty exciting to watch. You have clear liquid number one and clear liquid number two, and you pour them together and get this solid fluff. So if I tell you that you have a solid distributed in a liquid, I tend to picture tiny rocks swimming around in a liquid. It turns out that precipitates, solid precipitates, if you look at this image, we have a yellow fluff in this beaker, right? That yellow fluff is an insoluble precipitate. Precipitate is basically a fancy science way of saying something solid that happens in a reaction. That's all we're saying. But if you look at the third image, we can see that the yellow solid has solidified to, or like sunk to the bottom. Now, if you're taking Gen Chem 1 lab this semester, you will get to do versions of this experiment in lab. With your gloves on, you can reach in and kind of see this looks like it should be solid. But it's like a really, really fine solid. In order to get it to what you and I think of as a solid, like a grainy thing, you would have to filter it out of here and then go on and dry it to create a crystalline solid. So you could wipe your finger through there and it would kind of feel like, my dog is shedding, that like downy dog fur shed, where like there's not really a lot of solid there. You can kind of see it, you can see it on your finger. Please don't touch it without gloves on. But that's what you're looking at. So if you remember back to the start of chapter three, I said, we're not asking you to predict the product. Now we are. I mean, we're going to teach you how to predict the products. So in a precipitation reaction, so we've learned three reactions, combustion, combination, decomposition. This is the fourth one. We'll meet our next one on Wednesday. There's only five types, so we're getting there. This is what's called a metathesis reaction. Personally, my Texas history makes me call it a dusty do dough reaction. If you did not take square dancing as part of your education, it's really a tragedy in your life. But in this case, we can create this like swapping of anions or cations to allow us to predict the product. So in order to think about this, we want to think about what it means for something to be soluble or insoluble. So our textbook uses the definitions of soluble, completely dissolves, into ions, or just dissolves, into ions, and water. Insoluble is anything that is below Below 0.01 moles per liter. 
So earlier we talked about these weak ions where they kind of have this equilibrium. So it turns out that solubility also has an equilibrium. If you put rocks in a glass of water, for the most part, if you stirred them up, so a little bit, like not a lot, but a little bit of the rock would go into the water. If you put it in a blender, more of the rock would go in solution. It would be like drinking like tiny rocks, but you could do it. So the reality is there's this gray area between soluble and insoluble. For the most part, we're going to pretend that this is a yes no question. It either is soluble or it's not soluble. So most of the time, we are going to think about solubility in terms of ionic compounds. These are our best friends, where it is an A metal plus a non-metal, or a metal plus a polyatomic ion, or basically the polyatomics that we already know. Whereas a molecule is something where it is a bunch of non-metals creating a compound. So in this case, the ionic compounds are what we're going to really talk about solubility. So if you, we know that some things are insoluble in water. So um, there are things where the density of the two solutions gives you layers. We also know that rocks, just like a legitimate rock if you go in your garden, doesn't really dissolve into water. So we're going to think about that. So in the, I don't want to call it the olden days, in the past, one of the ways that they would ask about compounds is they would say, is it soluble? So they would take all these metals and they would basically make these grids of all of these different things and start mixing them together and ask, does this make a solid compound? Does this make a solid compound? Does that? So what they realized was, if you have a metal where the counter ion is a nitrate, it is always, like always, always, always soluble. If you have a carbonate ion, it's more often than not insoluble. So we've met like sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate, magnesium carbonate. Most carbonate complexes are insoluble. So this tells us that there are patterns. Gen Chem 1 is really full of patterns. So we have a solubility table on slide 17. I will bring you a paper copy on Wednesday. I'm going to ask that you memorize slash learn how to use it. You are responsible for this information. On the next mini exam, I will give you two compounds and ask you to predict what, what the products are and whether or not they're soluble. So the way we read this is the top is the soluble compounds. So if we look at sulfate, all sulfates are so all sulfate compounds are soluble except strontium, barium, mercury one, and lead two. All of the rest of them are soluble. On the bottom, it is the insoluble compounds, and the exceptions are soluble. In a non-shocking twist. Alex is going to have 9 million other compounds. I'm only going to ask you about things that fit in this graphic. Alex has a chart where the anions and cations are on different axes, and you basically look for places where you would have one anion and the other cation to see if it's soluble. I believe it's green and red. It might say soluble and insoluble. You can find that under the charts or the helpful tables graphic, wherever that's hidden. So once I give you that on Wednesday, we will work this example, because otherwise we cannot actually ascertain whether or not it's soluble without the graphic. So predicting the products. So if we look at this graphic, all the things that we, so in chapter four, I'm going to start taking stuff from chapter one and chapter two and chapter three, mixing it all together and making a different unique calculation. So in this case, we're going to start to look at either metathesis reactions or a do, -si -do depending on how you feel when you think about it. <clears throat> so in this case, we have the AX 
plus by gives you ay plus bx. So in order to predict the products, we are basically going to take the anions and swap their places, or the cations. Only one, if you switch both, then you just moved the A. We're looking at a combination of new products. So we're going to take our magnesium sulfate, Mg, NO2, NO3, 2, plus sodium hydroxide. We're going to ask, what do we make? So the first step is to decide what ions are in solution. So magnesium nitrate breaks down into two things. Magnesium 2 plus aqueous plus 2 NO3 minus aqueous. So this is basically just taking apart what we have at the top. Our sodium hydroxide, we're going to have a sodium plus aqueous plus an OH minus aqueous. So in order to predict the products, me some colored markers. So this cation is going to make a compound with this anion. Perhaps complexly or non-complexly, this anion and this cation are going to become a pair. So now we've taken the magnesium nitrate and the sodium hydroxide and basically said, okay, let's make a new partner. So for magnesium hydroxide, how many hydroxide molecules do I need to balance the magnesium? Two. So we're going to get magnesium hydroxide. Two. So the sodium nitrates are one to one, so that can make a complex. NaNO3. So is this equation balanced? No. So we know there are two nitrates here, which means we're going to have to put a two here. We have two hydroxides, so if we put a two here, now is it balanced? So it turns out that the next step with this is to start to ask ourselves, what is the precipitate? Now, Alex, not shockingly, will give you two compounds that makes two soluble compounds. That's kind of a waste. So in mine, one of them will be soluble and one of them will be your precipitate. So all nitrate ions are soluble. So this is aqueous. For the purposes of my course, if one of them is aqueous, the other one has to be the solid. In order for the rest of the parts that we'll work on on Wednesday, one of them has to be precipitate. So in order to write a metathesis reaction, which is what this is, you want to use the chemical formulas of the reactants to predict which ions are present. So that's what we did here. Then we're going to use the formulas and basically mix and match to make our two products. Then you're going to check your solubility rules. If one is insoluble, you make a precipitate. If they are both soluble, you get an NR, which means no reaction. So like nothing happened. And then you balance the equation. So on Wednesday, we're going to take this after we do our molarity calculation. And we're basically going to start to look at how do we predict these and how do we use the ability to predict them in our favor. What questions do we have before we move on? Yeah. Here? No. So in this case, there are two of these here, and it comes down here. So the two is actually found here. So on Wednesday, we're going to start writing out complete and net ionic equations, where we are going to use more of that information.
I feel like I've done a lot of like skill building that makes no sense. And I promise by the end of chapter four, all of the weird detours today will be like, I see where she was going. So in just a second, I'm going to give you your mini exam back. So a couple of things. The red zone is still the same as it was before. If you are scoring below a 48, no. Below a 57, you are not currently passing your mini exams. So all of these will count towards your final grade until we get to mini exam five. Mini exam three is October 6th, which is in, which is next week. The Wednesday after that is the midterm. The midterm is cumulative. I know I haven't looked at my October schedule, but I promise these are the real dates. So the keys for mini exam one and two are gonna open up here and just, when I go back up to my office, please make sure that you are figuring out what you did wrong so that as you begin to study, you can start to think like, okay, how can I move this forward? I will split these up by 